The Ancient Ones is a science fiction adventure that takes place on Earth 100,000 years ago. It is the survival tale of a teenage girl named Blue Flower who escapes into the wilderness as her tribe is captured by an opposing clan. Out in the far reaches of the desert landscape, she is rescued by a being from another world, and the two of them form a bond through music. I think you just made the comment about people who don't finish their books. They start and don't finish. Just make it a priority just just you know have that story finished have it told for yourself if you never complete that story you'll always be wondering what it could have been if you're done with it and you don't like it okay you know what it was but if you don't finish it you'll never know hey everyone welcome back to living the next chapter i have a great new author on the podcast he has pugs it's amazing. I got to meet them before we hit record. I'm super excited to meet any pug. I'm really, that's really fun. Uh, CB is on with me today. We're going to be talking about all the great things happening in his world. And I'm so excited to have him on the podcast. Welcome to the podcast. Nice to have you here. Thank you, David. It's great to be here. Let's talk a little bit right off the bat where you are in this big world of yours um, and where these beautiful pugs live. Oh, um, I live in Los Angeles, California. Uh, with my fiance and her family at the moment. Nice. Mm -hmm. Excellent. And the Great. cute hug dogs. They're amazing. Mm -hmm. And like I said, they need their own podcast. So we're going to work on that. Sounds uh, good. <laughs> so good. Talk to us a little bit about your author journey. How did this all start for you? And what was it like before you were an author? And what's it like now? Oh, it's um, it's been a journey. That's for sure. I moved out to Los Angeles after two years in New York, where I was trying to be an actor, I went to the New York Conservatory for Dramatic Arts. While I was there, I realized that I was not thinking in the same way that everybody else was about uh, the pieces that we were working on together. I would I would come in with thoughts about the story and the, the how how the characters are going to grow throughout the piece, what what the plot entails more so than maybe their my what my as an actor self had to do emotionally to prepare for the part, and I would bring up these big like plot points and continuity moments and stories that we were working on, and my teacher would be like, "Yeah, that's really interesting. Should we talk about acting now?" <laughs> so. I, I had been writing basically my whole life, but um, I hadn't really taken it as seriously while I was in uh, in high school and all that. And I started working on screenplays at that point once I realized I was caring more about the overall story. So when I moved out to L.A., I was still acting a bit. I was doing a production of Measure for Measure when I first came out here okay. to L.A. And all around the rehearsal periods and doing like it was like a two, maybe a three month run. Um, all throughout that, I would show up at the facility early, be prepared for my character and whatnot. And I would be writing uh, my first my first novella that I had completed. It's called uh, Forget the Complex. It comes second in that series. But uh, I, I wrote that whole thing um, with pen and paper just around rehearsals and production of that show. I found that it was inc incredibly fulfilling for me to be mm -hmm. able to do that. And it took a while for me to come back to prose because I was so focused on uh, screenplays for the, the the following 10 years. I say I've been out here since 2008. I didn't really get back to prose until COVID. And during COVID, I found that I had a safe space here with Madison, my fiance and her family. We have a really lovely backyard that I was able to spend my time in and uh, really get to work on bigger projects. I had written a screenplay around that time, a short screenplay. It was called Ancient Melody, and it was supposed to go in line with a series of short films that my friend Maxwell and I were working on. We wound up producing three of them together called Minuet. They won an award in Russia, which is super obscure. All wow. of them had different languages that we would uh that we translated the work into so it was a uh, german and french and then the final one combined those two and then eventually had some english this one i was trying to find some obscure language out there and i wound up you know COVID hit so i wasn't able to complete or i wasn't able to complete the production of that particular short film with maxwell 
But what I was able to do was realize that I had been in some place in my mind for all of my life working on this story. I'm going to rewind really quick to my childhood. My family, I'm a middle child. My family and I, we would take regular cross-country drives in our uh, Grand Marquis station wagon, uh, with the panels, the blue lining. Um, we, we hit every state that was drivable at the time in that car. And one particular visit that stayed with me my entire life was Mesa Verde. And Mesa Verde, if you know, has these fantastic, they're broken down quite a bit, but these incredible structures that were built right into the side of, of the canyon, of the Mesa. That awoke my imagination from an early age. And I wound up wanting to come back to structures such as that, such as Petra, that were built out of the sides of, of, of these massive, like, real world wild things uh that who were these people that were able to do that kind of that kind of thing what were they thinking in doing it so then i flash forward now to uh my time in the backyard of my fiance's family's house during covid i finally have time to work on my novels to take a larger screenplay that i created from the short film that i had been working on called ancient melody the larger screenplay became the ancient ones and i wanted to jump far back into the distant past. Let me read this really quick for you, the back of the book. The Ancient Ones is a science fiction adventure that takes place on Earth 100,000 years ago. It is the survival tale of a teenage girl named Blue Flower who escapes into the wilderness as her tribe is captured by an opposing clan. Out in the far reaches of the desert landscape, she is rescued by a being from another world, and the two of them form a bond through music. I wrote this whole book on pen and paper and on an old uh, mantra journal out in the backyard of my fiance's family's house. Uh, COVID was a really interesting time for me. I know it was really tough for everybody. It was definitely tough for us, but my creativity was awoken during that period. I was able to really fill in the gaps in the screenplays that I had been working on in between my bar jobs. I was able to take all of that time, all of my effort and put it into into prose. It's amazing. Okay, so talk a little bit about taking your acting career and all the things you know as an actor. How do you, how can you take that skill set and bring it to being an author? Was there any kind of special superstar things that you have or another author who has no background in acting? You have something special that you can bring to writing just based on that? I think as an actor, I have a different literary knowledge than a lot of writers would have otherwise because of the pieces that I've had to study in an attempt to have a career as an actor in an attempt to get to know those characters and I know I was talking down about myself in school and saying that I uh I took the story um and gave it more credence than the individual character's journey but that's something I had to realize about myself and when I'm in the process of writing I think that I fit myself into the individual character's emotional journeys as well it is a part of my process to feel that emotion as well. Because I think when I talk to other authors, CBA, the one thing they struggle with is they feel like as they're writing their book that they're at like arm's length away from their characters. They're writing about them, but they've never really experienced the life through their lens, through their eyes as characters in their book, where you have to get into character. You have to be the character on stage, on camera, whatever. You have to kind of be the person. So I think that's kind of a unique thing that you have is the ability to not only write about a character, but actually be the character. That's quite unique, I think, for an author to have that kind of skill set. Oh, yeah, uh, definitely. And thank you. I mean, like, I always appreciate that kind of uh, praise. And uh, yeah, I, I, uh, I definitely would get emotional. And sometimes Madison would have to would have to help me out, make sure that I remembered to eat while I was in the process because I'd be going through whatever emotional journey that character was going through. Blue Flower in particular, also Silent Wolf in this novel goes through quite a journey. And I don't, I haven't talked to anybody about him yet, really. So uh, is that something we could- I would uh, love to, let's go, let's do that. Come on. So 
Blue Flower in the first place. Uh, she escapes into the wilderness. She meets uh, this alien that we that goes by the being at the sto- at the start of the story. Her journey is about trying to save her people. Silent Wolf is a young man in the Tetset tribe who is supposed to already be capable of saving his people. He's expected as a young warrior male to be able to protect them. And he's instantly taken out of the fight. He gets he gets knocked unconscious and captured, tied up, walked through the desert with the opposing clan and all of his people who know that he did nothing to help them. And he just, he loses himself completely. And that was quite a journey to go on uh, talking about uh, as an actor dealing with the emotional journey of the character it was really painful I felt myself going through that from time to time while writing his se- his sequences he doesn't know who he's supposed to be anymore and he doesn't know who he can trust anymore because the only people around him that have any say in the matter are his basically sworn enemies so who is he if he has to listen to their demands and follow what they have to say and for some reason they treat him nicely so it's even more confusing as an as an author do you find yourself reflecting back in your characters do you see yourself in the story at all i mean i there must be there must be some part of me that feels that way i maybe there's there's an there's a part of me that um i owned a house before before covid yeah. and i wound up having to leave that situation for reasons that were very um difficult somewhat dramatic um unfair at times and there's certainly a possibility that silent wolf is my struggle through that period of time trying to understand who i'm supposed to be blue flower would be my gung-ho attitude towards actually working on this book and actually feeling like i was capable of taking this journey silent wolf is the other side of myself where yeah absolutely i I felt broken. I felt confused. I felt like the world was not necessarily the place that I had expected it to be um, for the previous maybe five years or so that I had lived in that space. So was that something you planned on writing or did that happen in the course of writing that you your character started to reflect you? In the screenplay, his journey was something I planned. Okay. But in the novel, his journey grew quite a bit. And in fact, grew in multiple ways, because even when I worked with uh, Alyssa Matasek, my uh, developmental editor, she found moments for me that I was like, oh, that's such a that's such a good point. That's such an easy fit. That makes exact that's that's exactly what I would have been feeling in that time. So it definitely not it it came up organically at a point when I like uh, the screenplay turned really into my outline for the novel. But there were so many interesting surprises throughout that process if somebody were to read the screenplay today and read the novel they would see some huge leaps um science fiction wise uh with ideas that i that i uh was playing with and i think they would see some big leaps in who silent wolf is as a character who also quotal who i have not spoken about is as a character i think that those are very exciting things that have evolved like i said organically through that process. So some of my audience, CB, are new authors who are sitting in the backyard, writing their book, struggling through and trying to make sense of it all. And and you are at the point now where you have a copy of the book in your hand, which I love. That's beautiful. Um, some inspiration for a new author who's listening to us talk. And they're at the very beginning of their journey of creating a story and creating a novel and all of that, what would you say if you were listening to this podcast before the pandemic, before the book was even a thought, and you were listening to this as a new author, potentially going to write a book, what would you like to tell yourself that would have been helpful in the process of writing this? It might sound funny, but I think the first note is uh, allow yourself to have a team. Even though you the writing process is by yourself putting pen to paper putting uh, fingers to keys you need people around you that respect the decisions that you're making are engaged or willing to be engaged it's tough to find sometimes it was tough for me for a long time 
I have my fiance Madison. When I first started uh, working on these, I didn't uh, show them to her. And I'm like, well, I'm working on a book. Why don't we read the book out loud with each other? And she'll know the story. And it was a different way for us to bond, for me to have that person there who understood what I was going through mm -hmm. uh, in the process. And then after the fact, same thing, the team aspect of it, don't be afraid to spend a little bit of money to get your team together as well. Madison actually found me my artist for this particular project, a friend of ours, Aurelia Lozano, and she did a fantastic job with the cover, which was not supposed to be the cover initially, and it wound up turning into it. And that was really exciting for, I think, all three of us. Um, but also my developmental editor, Alyssa Matesic, really, uh, it was a, a big deal for me to, to take what, what little savings I had and put it into that. If I think it, I think it wound up being very worthwhile um, for me to rediscover aspects of this story that I might have taken for granted prior to the first, you know, the second draft. By the time I got through to the third draft, I had Maddie's ear, I had Alyssa's ear, I had uh, Aurelia's ear. And now I have Kat, my publicist's mm -hmm. ear as well. And between all of those different team members who are willing to be engaged in the process, uh, that support system is so is so important. And I know as an author, you can be it's it's easy to be shy and to not put yourself out there and to not say thank you, to not think of other people as part of the process. But everybody in your life is a part of the process in one way or another. If you can find those people that help to hold you up, to support you when you have to be at your most emotional, when you have to be at your most vulnerable, mm -hmm. that, that's everything. Okay, so I'm going to get out of the way and I want you to give the podcast to you for this moment. And I want you to thank those people you just mentioned, specifically speak to them because they're going to hear this episode. And there's, they're celebrating with you that the book is done and you have a copy. But instead of talking through me to them, and I know Madison's right there in the room with you, but it's a little awkward maybe there, but I would love for you to thank them publicly for what they mean to you and to just bring it full circle to the fact that a team is important to hear your thoughts and you to hear your thanks for your team. I just kind of want to turn it over to you and let you to do that. What, did you, what would you say to your team as they're listening to the episode? Thank you, Madison. You're the best. I love you. You've been so supportive this whole time, and I really appreciate all of the space, all of the tiny meals, all of the your ear for all of these different weird stories that I've been putting out there to you. I really appreciate you. Thank you for giving me a space to live in as well. Thank you to your family, to Don and Crystal and Tyler and Brenda, to the Pugs as well, Oscar and Emmy. Uh, for allowing me to be in this space. Sometimes I can be very difficult to be around and I appreciate you guys all letting me be here and letting me, you know, not ruin your day. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Alyssa, for your hard work. I really appreciated your notes and I really hope that we can work together again soon on the next book, which uh, is ready for you. I got to get the money together though. Thank you, Aurelia, for such fantastic art pieces even though only two of them made it into this book we both know that you did a lot of work and really really killed it with all those other pieces they were just perfect for the story thank you cat for getting me onto this podcast with david here thank you david mm. you, you've been a great host already thank you maxwell for driving me out to the trona pinnacles which is not an easy drive to realize that that was a place that would be important to my book, to showing me that there was a museum out there, even though neither one of us knew it. I haven't been there yet, but it kept giving me these thoughts. Thank you to Aaron and Dan for uh, being the reason that Madison and I went to Japan before COVID and making me realize that there's an aspect of Japan in this too. I wound up getting a book. Um, it's called Ancient Jomon of Japan by Junko Habu. It's not a it's not a work of fiction. Um, it is it is ancient clay pottery and uh, where the people lived and how they how they moved around and uh, through their land. These people that aren't supposed to exist anymore. Uh, it fits in very well with the themes that I was working on. And I never would have even thought to find that book if it hadn't been for our trip to Japan to see Aaron and Dan. 
who uh, we miss tremendously. They are so far away from us. Thank you to Gabe and Mira, who I moved out here with, who always supported my writing, even when it was just little things back then. And I miss you guys as well. You're so far away. They're in Florida now. Thank you to my parents <laughs> for driving me across country with my siblings. And thank you to my siblings too for being there and dealing with me at that time when I was just as difficult, but in a very different way. Thank you to all of you guys for uh, giving me this opportunity in my life to, to have this creative energy and to not make me feel badly about wanting to be a writer or an actor or whatever it was that I was trying to be at those times. I can say too, my mother really championed this story. I think that there was an aspect of it where her love of ancient cultures and her interest in those places, I think we went to Mesa Verde because of her. Her love of those things has been in me since that time in childhood. So when I showed her the book, I was really, uh, I was really scared to show it to her. Um, we hadn't bonded in a long time about anything like that. And I hadn't uh, shown her any of my work since the novellas. And the novellas I had written such a long time ago now, it feels like even though they only came out a couple of years, maybe what was it, five years ago, four years ago that they came out. But I had written them so long before that I just had to get them out. And this is a different story. This one I wrote and I intended it to be this piece that's happening now that's going to be out in stores on October 10th. Yeah. I really have gotten the chance to bond with my mother a great deal more than I anticipated because of this work. So CB, um, are you going to, you have any plans to take the book out to the backyard and, and read it in the place where it was written? I just can't, that'd be a cool moment to just sit out there and, and read that, read your work in that environment. I think that's kind of cool. You know, I think it's a really great idea. Um, yeah, we had a party the other day and her, her cousin, Madison's cousin was there um, and she was reading um, in the corner and drawing some stuff in the corner by those same plants where I had written a lot of the book. And uh, I came over, I approached her and I started asking her what she wanted and she wanted to tell stories. And so I brought out a copy with, uh, with the not for resale band on it, a copy of the book. And she was really excited to take it. And she kept putting it out in front of her while she was drawing stuff and like thinking about it, flipping through it. I'm very excited about that. Um, but yes, to answer your question, I think that's a great idea. I am intending to, since I since I have an actor's background, I'm intending to uh, do an audio book and to record it myself. So maybe, maybe I do that in the backyard. If I can keep the sound down back there, then maybe I try to use a nice microphone and I do it back there. That's a great idea. And then that would give me an added excuse to go and be with the book again. It also opens the doors for people who can't read physically and can listen to the book and they can experience it as well. Absolutely. So great idea, CB. I love that. It's amazing. Okay. So this is by far not the end of your writing career by any means. And it's still early. And I know we want to celebrate the book and it's so cool that it's coming out in October. You, there must, the name of my podcast is living the next chapter. So there's got to be a next chapter for you. How are you living your next chapter? So I have since then, since the first draft of The Ancient Ones, I have been writing consistently every day. I have completed three more novels that are in first draft form. The next one takes place in, in the not so distant future, about 200 years from now. And it's about um, a single mother in a sort of somewhat post-apocalyptic place with her son, but it's a it's a corpocracy, you know, like a like a corporation state, and she is trying to climb that corporate ladder in a post-apocalyptic world while still trying to figure out how to communicate with her son, and I think that's a big theme of all of my books. Uh, um, the four that I've written so far, there's a big theme about, about learning, trying to understand how to communicate with each other as the, the big thing. Um, and that's what this one's about. So she uh, is introduced to, to a, an app, basically, that gives her an opportunity to speak with her son uh, in a new way, helps her through the process, but it doesn't always go the way that you intend it to say that. So CB, for this book that's coming out in October, 
who is the ideal reader? Who do you have in mind? Who would probably, if you could describe that reader to me, who would enjoy this book so that we can kind of get some sense of who this may be a great gift idea for as well? The Ancient Ones is interesting in that it's just as much big adventure and action as it is sci-fi, but it also takes place in a time period that I've never seen explored in a in a true sci-fi piece as far back as i can think like like the beginning of prometheus goes sort of back but that goes way 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 before the formation of humans this goes back to when humans are already around they weren't expected to be here in these continents at that time but recent you know discoveries keep saying that there's a chance there's a chance that they were here and then they left and they came back so back and forth the Ancient Ones is, I think it's an interesting audience because I think it, I think it can speak to so many people. Uh, when I was looking for publicists and uh, ad representatives and whatnot, I was looking for, I, I, I stated YA to adult. I stated anybody who was interested in the concept of ancient aliens, but also it could be for people who are interested in the discovery of ancient cultures in general. And yeah, none of these cultures that are represented in my book are real people, but the research that I put in to try to understand different ancient cultures at different periods of time, I think that plays in well to what you witness with these people. But yeah, I mean, at the end of the day, if you if you think aliens are cool, I have I have a bunch of different alien types in this book. So it's like, that's kind of what it comes down to. I mean, if you think that ancient stone structures that how the hell did this form are cool, then that's something else as like, you know, if you're excited about about that, if you're excited about music, there's music in this, even though you can't hear it. It's a big part of the story. If uh, Yeah. It's hard to describe the audience. I think I think it could have a pretty broad audience, and that's the whole thing that's so exciting. Big fight sequences, action, yeah. I love the fact that you have a whole a whole team of crowd cheering you on here as we do our episode together. That's cool. I love watching you look off camera, and you're like, oh, yeah, and this, too. That's great. Um, so the, the music side of it, I'm a musician. I love music. So what part of the music fed the writing of the book, why was that important to you as an author to include that musical references as well? Um, I've always been intrigued by how we would first be able to communicate with an alien species. Um, every time that I sit down and I try to write sci-fi that's going to have aliens involved in it, I have to stop for a moment. And the first thing that always comes to mind is music. Uh, so it makes like Close Encounters of the Third Kind work. It's music. That's how they communicate. It's not like there's the film Arrival and they do a really fantastic job of making linguistics at the heart of that story. I've never read that book though. I would love to read it. I should read that. We should put that on our list actually. Uh, the music was obviously part of the short film, The uh, Ancient Melody. Um that was going to be the primary language of the piece actually was the song that they played together to realize that they can be friends, that they can help each other out. When I got to writing the screenplay, the scene changed, but the music still played an important factor in it. And the music plays such a big role in the first, at least half of the book, if not more of how these beings can communicate with each other. I had to kind of work on what that looked like though because obviously it's a book it doesn't have uh the opportunity for music if i didn't put i didn't put any sheet music in here i worked with a musician named carter soso um on a song that would have made it into the short film that hasn't happened and that was cool and that was a fun process thank you carter for that uh but it's it's it became this really interesting thing where i had to play with how the sound impacted the character how that uh the imagery that came from the sound was illuminated how did she understand what the being was saying to her how do they understand one another through this music what is this uh, she was playing an instrument that's the, this is blue flower the main character it was playing an instrument that i called a copa and it's like an old uh, a really ancient flute type piece with a with a weird like pipe type ending and she was playing it and trying to that's how that's how the two of them were were communicating with one another. But then the being is able to basically 
uh, perform through itself, through its own body is like an instrument with these things that come out kind of. And, uh, oh, man, I was listening to a lot of like Duder and Inaudi during the time. Um, Johan Johansson, I think that's how you pronounce it, those kinds of uh, composers and really drawing inspiration and that would help me with the story and everything. Music is just ingrained in what the fabric of this piece is and it's just important to life to have good music around all of the time. So that's how they communicate. That's how that's how they communicate. So, okay, so as a musician, you got me then. I love, I love how you're bringing that into the story. So that's going to be a that's going to be fun to see how the music pieces play throughout because the music can be its own character as well, which I love. For sure. That. For sure. For sure. And there are scenes where the music is meant to feel different, even though you can't hear it. Hopefully uh, I paint a picture of how it, how, how it works um, where it just feels completely different from the previous song that you would have heard if you were in that space. And if this ever gets adapted into a feature film, I would really fight for um, a great, musical team to be involved in making those songs something special and uh and action-packed and thematic and beautiful nice you know so okay take me back to the moment the book arrives on your doorstep it's gone from an idea through the backyard as you've written it and now it's in your hands for a new author that hasn't got to this part yet but they're looking forward to that day what does it feel like when there's a knock at the door or, and you open the door and there it's sitting waiting for you for the first time in book form, what does that feel like? Take me to the doorstep. What day was it? What time of day was it? What what was the weather like? Uh, tell me exactly what it felt like. Oh, oh, that's its own story. That's its own story. You didn't know there was a hurricane, or supposed to be a hurricane here in Los Angeles, right? Which uh, which is abnormal for sure. It hasn't happened in almost ninety years that there's been a tropical storm, a hurricane that's made it uh, to the west coast. And uh, the rain's coming down, or the rain's about to come down. It's supposed to come down. It's supposed to come down. I'm looking on Amazon where I'm getting my first copy to come through KDP, and the and the I'm like, oh no, it's not going to get it's not going to get here until the rain's going on. It's supposed to arrive during the middle of the storm, and then it arrives like you know the day before. And I'm like, all right, hey, it's here, it's here. It's not gonna get blasted in the weather. We did obviously like we we survived this storm. It was not, you know, I've been through a couple of these kinds of things, but the book was there, and uh, I tore the bag open from KDP and I pull it out, and it's got the band on. I'm like, oh, okay, well, oh, why is the barcode on the back covered up? But whatever, this looks beautiful. It looks beautiful. I can physically hold it. Then I open it up, and it's double spaced. <laughs> <laughs> nice. <laughs> Uh, oh, that's why that's why the page count was so much longer than it needed to be. Uh, there you go. <laughs> <laughs> that's a big note. That's an important thing for any author that's uh, that's going to experience this. It's like it felt really cool to have it in my hand. And Maddie's holding on to that copy with a double spaced copy that's like 500 something pages. The book itself is 312. That's how yeah. long it should be. I did 1.2 spacing and I was so happy to know it when I got that copy in the mail to know once I opened it. Oh yeah, I know exactly what I need to do now. It wasn't right, but it feels great to have it in my hands. What a great mm -hmm. moment, right? That's that, mm -hmm. and that's what I'm looking forward to for the authors that are listening is that they're going to have that moment as well. So to treasure that moment, be excited about it, celebrate, you know, that's a big, that's a big task. There's so many people who want to write a book they want to write a novel, um, but they never actually get around to it. They never actually finish it. They never get that joy of opening the front door and having it sitting there waiting for you. That's You need to celebrate that because that's a, that's a big milestone. Absolutely. Absolutely. It's amazing. Um, CB, before we go, where does everybody connect with you? Where are you most active online? Somebody wants to talk to you about your book or maybe have you come and speak or they want to talk music, whatever. Where do they find you? Where are you most active? I'm on Instagram at CB Sci-Fi. My website is uh, my publishing site. It's odomslibrary.com. And that's the publishing house. I can be found on LinkedIn. That's an easy way to find me. Use my author name. It's CB Stroll on LinkedIn. Those are the primary, probably best, uh, best sites. You can contact my publicist. 
<laughs> Catherine Kennedy. She is amazing. By yeah, the she's way. so great, right? Amazing. So mm -hmm. before we go, CB, anything else that you want to mention? Maybe we haven't talked about, and it's really on your on your mind, on your heart that you wanted to share with our audience of readers and authors. Anything else that kind of stands out to you? Uh, I think you just made the comment about people who don't finish their books; they start and they don't finish. Just make it a priority. Just, just, you know, have that story finished, have it told for yourself. If you never complete that story, you'll always be wondering what it could have been. If you're done with it and you don't like it, okay, you know what it was. But if you don't finish it, you'll never right. know. I love it. CB, you're an amazing guest on my show. I want to thank you for being on my podcast. I, I know you have, again, you have your whole cheering squad there with you. And I hope that you celebrate after the episode's done and everything as well. Um, I'm really looking forward to staying in touch with you and following your career as an author now and uh, excited to see what's next for you. It's uh, it's amazing to to know that all these good things are happening. And again, the support of your family and your, your friends, it's it shows on your face how much they mean to you. So thank you for doing the little shout outs as well. I think that's going to be very meaningful to them as well. Thank you, David. You're an awesome host, and I really appreciate you having me on your show. I would love to be a uh, friend of the show in the future and come back for other, oh, other projects. I'm going to keep the door open to crack. You can come back anytime you want, and uh, we'll just keep that Thank open you. for you, okay? Sounds awesome. good. Everyone, all the information for CB is going to be in the uh, show notes. I would encourage you to go buy this book, gift this book. You can send it right to your friends and family and let them have a copy of this as well. Let's do lots of sales. And as the book comes out in October, um, buying that book, leaving an amazing review for CB wherever you buy this book online. Make sure that everyone knows that you love this book and you support another great author in his author journey. CB, thank you so much for being part of this. Awesome. Thank you. <laughs> jumping here at the very end I want to thank you for coming we have listeners around the world and I got to tell you as a podcaster it is so great to hear back from the people who listen to the show now you are still here the podcast's over like we're sweeping up and putting the chairs away you're still here so hi I would love to talk to you no, no, I really, really would. I would love to hear your voice. I would love to hear from you through email. You can do all that at livingthenextchapter.com. I say it fast because I love it. Living the next chapter. It's the name of the podcast. Dot com. How's that for easy? Right? Right. So come on over there and let's have a conversation. You can set up time in my calendar. You can air quote here book <laughs> book time in my calendar book next chapter let's have a conversation thanks for being here see you on the next one cheers <laughs>